We'll use the tools of calculus to come up with an expression for the gravitational potential energy. Uh, not an approximation of MGH, but the uh, accurate gravitational potential energy uh, expression. So this and ties in a little bit in general. If you have a conservative force, such as gravity or the force of a spring, not friction, um, that force has an associated potential energy. Uh, the electrical force as well <coughs> has a potential energy. And we're going to use the connection between force and potential energy to uh, come up with an expression for the gravitational potential energy. So if we have an expression for the potential energy as a function of x, we could take the derivative of that, apply a minus sign front, and we would have the force. Uh, expression for the force. Well, if I multiply both sides by dx, I'm going to take the minus sign off to the left. Um, in terms of vectors, you know, the, this is really work is creating this potential energy. Uh, so the vector, the dot product force dx gives us potential energy. In this situation for that I'm going to discuss here for gravity, <clears throat> the dx and the force are 180 degrees opposite to each other. If we just draw a little sun diagram here, uh, some distance r away, I'm going to switch to uh, an r variable rather than x, but taking this in a straight line. Gravity, the force of gravity, say, on the Earth is directed towards the sun. If we were thinking of moving the Earth farther away from the sun, we would have a dr or dx off to the right. But these are 180 degrees <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, apart from each other. So that cosine of 180 degrees produces what number? <coughs> yep, cosine of 180 degrees is minus 1. So the minus 1 here and the minus uh, out in front of there, we get a positive. So f dx is u. And then we would take the uh, antiderivative of both sides here. Is the force constant? Can it move through the antiderivative symbol? The answer is no. The force of gravity gets weaker as we go further away. So that complicates our uh, calculation here of the potential energy. Uh, let, let's go ahead and uh, proceed. So we're going to have some change in the potential energy. If we do this uh, du here from uh, lower limit of u1, upper limit of u2, and we just simply get u2 minus u1 for the antiderivative of du evaluated at the two limits. The more work has to be done here for the force of gravity. And again, I'm switching to r rather than dx. Now we're moving in a straight line here, so um, dr, dx, they're the same one to one. There's no conversion factor, just change of symbols. But the gravitational uh, force expression is in terms of r, our distance from center to center of the two objects. So our force, capital G, the universal constant of gravity, the two masses that are involved in attracting each other, and distance squared between their centers. And we have to take the antiderivative of this. It's not difficult. Um, so the g, m1, m2, those are constants. They come out in front of the antiderivative. And we have dr over r squared. This would be r to the minus 2 dr. It's another way of uh, expressing this. And in terms of uh, calculus, when we take the antiderivative, we increase the power by 1. So this can be r to the minus 1. That's a 1 over r. And divide by the new power, minus 1. That creates a minus sign in front here. So this dr over r squared produces a function minus 1 over r. Look that up in a table of antiderivatives if you uh, want to. We have to evaluate this at the two limits, r2 and r1. So we do that. Minus 1 over r2 minus a minus 1 over r1. Uh, this minus sign here always comes in when you do the evaluation of the lower limit, you always stick in a minus sign. That's the method of evaluating the antiderivative. And now if we apply the minus, you know, multiply this, these minus signs together, 
we're going to get a positive term here, a negative term here. Distribute G M1 M2 on both of these terms. And we get an expression here for the change in the potential energy is G M1 M2 over R1 minus G M1 M2 over R2. Um, and again, R1 is the position that's closer, let's say, to the sun. R2 is farther away. Um, and we're increasing the potential energy as we move from R1 to R2. This makes sense. It requires work to move something further away from the sun. And the object has more potential energy as it's further away. It could fall back in and increase the kinetic energy uh, of the object. Uh, let's let the U1 value be 0 for the case of R1 equals infinity. You always have a choice as where to set the potential energy equal to zero. It doesn't affect the uh, working of the problem, but it simplifies the expression. If we let the potential energy be zero when the uh, uh, position is infinite. So that's just in general, whether it's U1 or U2 or R1 or R2. Uh, we'll let the get rid of the ones there. We'll let the potential energy be zero when the distance between the two objects is infinite. That makes sense. There's going to be zero force when we have infinite distance between the two objects. Um, so if we do that, we can say that this U2, uh, just by itself, it doesn't matter where you put R1 and R2, uh, but this U2, the potential energy, would be minus gm1 m2 over r. Now something about this, this is, uh, this is always negative. It only gets to be zero when we're infinitely far apart. So uh, these two masses, there is going to be some finite distance between two real masses. And we have a, a situation where the potential energy is always negative. That's not a problem. Again, it's change in potential energy that is important in working out problems. So it does not matter that the potential energy is always negative. But that's our traditional choice. Let the potential energy be zero when r is infinity. So what is the specific gravitational potential energy value for the Earth-Sun situation? Well, I can put in the numbers here, the constant of gravitation, the mass of the sun, the mass of the earth, the distance average between the sun and the earth. The earth's orbit's not completely circular, but there's our uh, uh, value to use. And if you do that, you find that the potential energy is minus 5.31 times 10 to the 33rd joules. That's a big number. The sun has a lot of mass. So that is our potential energy situation. And we're in a situation here where um, if we somehow wanted to break free from the sun, we have to bring our total energy up to zero. And that's a, a different video, but the total energy will be kinetic plus potential. This is only the potential side of the calculation. And uh, I have another video that you can look at to find the total energy that adds the kinetic and uh, potential energy. But potential energy, MGH is not accurate when we're at great distances uh, away. Uh, MGH cannot be used here. This is a better way of calculating the gravitational potential energy. It's more accurate. R is the distance between the centers of the two masses. You must have two masses to have a potential energy. If there's only one mass in the universe, there is no potential energy. Um, R, again, distance between the centers of the two objects, not their edges but distance between the centers of the two objects. So practice with that. Ask your instructor if you have questions.